Welcome, everyone. We are so happy to have you here joining us. Um, we have guests from throughout the state and the country, and we're so excited to be together, even if we can't be in the same room, to really have a great conversation, remind ourselves we're a part of a bigger community, and to really tap into our vision, our vision and mission of Rocky Mountain Public Media, of a Colorado where everyone is seen and heard. I'm Amanda Mountain. I'm the president and CEO, and I am so excited that we have our esteemed colleague here with us. Yeah, Michelle Sindor, thank you for taking the time out of your very busy schedule to join us. And my colleague, Dana Knowles, major, um, multimedia journalist on our team. I wanna thank all of you for taking time to be in community with us and have this conversation. We couldn't do it without you, our family of members. Um, thank you for all that you do. And Dana, I will turn it over to you. Thank you. I'm, I'm really, really excited to be here to interview and kind of chat with Yamish Alcindor, the woman who we watched you go toe to toe with our former president, I don't know how many times. And I I rewatched uh, quite a bit of your work over the last few days. And I'm just amazed how every single time he sort of came at you, you always responded with information, just information. Every jab, was re the, the response was information. So um, I'm really excited to have uh, Yamish Alcindor here with us. I know many of our viewers are familiar with her work, but for those of you who are meeting her for the first time, you will be impressed. Yamish is an award-winning winning journalist based in Washington, D.C. She joined the PBS NewsHour in 2018 as a Washington correspondent and has appeared as a political contributor to MSNBC since 2013 and NBC News since 2016. In 21, 2021, she was named the moderator for Washington Week. Yamish's newest role starting very soon is Washington correspondent for NBC News. She'll continue, though, to moderate Washington Week, which I know makes this audience and me very happy. Thank you so much for joining us. We're really glad that you're here and uh, that you're able to take out your time to take out some time to talk with us. Do um, you want to just dive in? For sure. I'm excited to be here. Thank you so much. I'm excited to, to meet, of course, the folks um, in Colorado and, and maybe folks that are even outside of Colorado who are tuning in. I'm excited um, to have this conversation. It's obviously the news is wild. If I'm looking down at my phone, it's because I'm trying to figure out who's getting subpoenaed next. <laughs> well, Mitch McConnell is, is fighting with Trump in some new ways. So that's that's what I do all day, every day is just try to keep in touch and, and try to keep abreast of all the craziness that's going on. Um, but super happy to be here. So that like is a perfect lead into my first question, which is, do you feel a sense of burnout at this point after, you know, the last few years? I mean, I feel like journalism is always crazy, but particularly like the last two to four years, do you feel a sense of just uh, like, how, how are you right now? So I, because journalism is my love, it is my passion, it's the thing that I could do every single morning and not get tired of, I am lucky um, that I don't feel burnout. I feel as though I am someone who has been able to balance um, through the pandemic and all the things that we've all had to live with as Americans and as people on this earth in this in, the, in this last two years, I've been able to sort of balance that with a love for my work. So I really um, enjoy the work. I think it's a, an incredible privilege to to report on the White House, to report on Capitol Hill, um, to question presidents. Uh, I'm I'm the child of, of immigrants that came here from Haiti, um, and every time I I I I'm on TV or I'm walking it through the White House, I think, what would my grandparents think? Um, mm. So for me, I really have this sort of grounding. In this idea that I, I met my sort of ancestors, my grandmother who came here at 62 years old from Haiti, um, leaving everything she knew behind. So for me, that's sort of the 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 mindset that I come to this with. And I will say, you know, for me as someone who's married to a journalist, um, I'm not only sort of working as a journalist. I'm then you know coming home and maybe editing my husband's stories, and he's maybe editing my scripts, and we're sort of chatting about the news. Um, but we've also we're also people who sort of binge watch TV and take time for a walk. So for me, I've really leaned into that, especially over the last two years with this collective grieving that we're all doing. Um, it's been important to me to also make sure that like my mental health is taken care of and that it's it's something I nourish. So you're able to practice some self care and kind of rejuvenate after doing all that you do. For sure. That's great. <laughs> That's good because we love what you do. Um, 
how has the change of presidential ad administrations impacted how you do your job? Do you feel like it's easier getting information from the current in administration as opposed to the past administration? It's a great question. And I think it's, it's a complex answer because um, I think it, it's, it, the news and the information was flowing out of the Trump administration. Uh, you know, there are so many leaks, so many people calling you up to sort of tell them their arrival in, in the administration. But the information sometimes was misinformation. Sometimes it was lies. Sometimes it was sort of the, the spin of Washington that is very much um, done with Republicans and Democrats. But I think there was also this sort of real credibility issue that was that was unique to the Trump administration and the people that he surrounded himself with. So I don't know if my job's gotten easier. I just think that it's different in some key ways, but I also think in some key ways, it's exactly the same. Um, the Biden administration, while they are, I think I would probably say they're, I think if, if we talk to the fact checkers in DC, they're probably not, um, they're not able, they're not really requiring the fact checking that we saw at, with the Trump administration, but they're still spinning, right? They're still um, saying things to journalists that sometimes are problematic. We, we know that the president um, cursed at a reporter. We know that the, 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 the White House um, press secretary at one point, she sort of mocked the idea of sending out testings and sending out tests to Americans, COVID tests to Americans. She herself from the podium um, has said that that was like a wrong thing for her to do. The president, of course, has apologized, President Biden, that is, has apologized to journalists um, when he's lost his temper. So I think the tone overall is more respectful in this administration and in, in that there's this sort of tuss and tussle um, this tense, this, this sort of tense relationship that I think is built into our constitution. The press is in the constitution, so is the president, so is is Congress. I think that that tells you that naturally we were going to sort of be at odds, and we should be at odds because I'm asking questions, and sometimes the White House doesn't want to answer them, or the White House wants us to be focusing on one thing when the press corps is saying, you know what, we have this other thing that we are, we need to focus on. So I I think it's 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 overall sort of. Um, just a different experience. I will say that it's all been in some ways very, very interesting. And I still, during the Trump administration, I had this real sense of responsibility of history. Um, and I think that that has carried through in the Biden administration where we're still dealing with historic issues um, and, and it's important to do the work well. So what's your level of trust um, when you have to do these interviews with this administration comparatively? So as a journalist, I'm naturally suspicious. So <laughs> right. I, especially as a reporter, everything, right? Right, right. Especially as a reporter for me who who got my start um as a beat reporter, a breaking news reporter on the cops beat, someone who always um wanted to double check everything, someone who was always saying, Okay, I know that the, you know, there was a time I think in the in in and I think maybe we're still in this time, but it's we've we've sort of tried to pivot where whatever the police said, where that was the thing that you trusted. And then George Floyd and all these other things happened. And mm -hmm. you realize that police lie, just like everyone else. They're human beings. Um, that doesn't mean that they lie all the time, but it means that you have to fact check everything. So I don't trust any of the information that I get from anybody. I always want to double check it. I always want to tell people, this is where I got this information from. Here's the context within which this information came to me that I'm sharing with you. I think that that's critical, which I think goes back to the idea of sort of the differences in administration. Some people think like, oh, okay, well now you're done sort of having <laughs> to, to, to check all the information and doing fact checkers. And it's like, no, the fact checkers are still employed. We are still making sure that we're checking out all the information. If Biden, if President Biden is saying, you know, this is a great week with the economy, we're wanting to talk to experts on the economy to figure out is what he's saying accurate. Um, same thing with COVID and the pandemic, policing or voting rights, all a number of, of topics that we're, that we're covering. So when someone sits down and tells me something, I always triple check it. Sure, sure. Because everyone's going to spin anyway, like you like you said. Um, well, you be wrong, right? Like the yeah. Could, sometimes or right. anybody could just be wrong. You just speak. You think you're you think that it that, that there was a drop in twelve percent when you check it. It's six percent. Like mm -hmm. it could be nefarious. It could be spinning, or it could just be sort of misunderstandings. Either exactly. way, it's the role. It's our role um, to to check all those facts. Definitely. Um, I'm curious what your primary sort of mission or goal was when you originally decided you wanted to be a journalist and how old were you when that, when you sort of had that thought in your head, like, this is kind of what I think I want to do with my life. 
So I would say I probably knew I wanted to be a journalist around 16, 17 years old. I learned about the story of this boy named Emmett Till. He was a 14 year old who was murdered in 1955. And he was really a martyr of the civil rights movement. Um, the March on Washington took place eight years to the date after he was murdered. His mother had this courageous decision to show her son's mutilated, tortured body to the world in an open casket funeral. Um, his picture went around the world and was a, and, and specifically was in Jet Magazine, African American um, Magazine. And I learned that story and learned the power of journalism, the power of imagery, the power of sort of ordinary people doing extraordinary things and wanted to be a journalist as soon as I learned that. So my first uh, place that I worked was a, was a weekly African American newspaper called the West Side Gazette. Um, they gave me my first chance at journalism. I had no experience, no expertise, um, but it's so critical that people give you your first shot and the rest is sort of how my my career evolved. But um, that's that was, that was sort of the mission. The mission was to tell stories about civil rights, to tell stories um, that were showing the ugly parts of our country and also to challenge sort of people who are in powerful positions, whether you're a sheriff, whether you're the president, whether you're a, 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 a congressperson, my goal was to sort of make sure that that people, powerful people were being held accountable and they were being posed questions that related to the sort of ex the existence, the ability for people to survive and thrive in America. I grew up in Miami, Florida, a working class family, single mom. And for me, I knew that I wanted to make sure when I was a journalist to, 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 to ground my journalism in that. So what I hope people will see when they when they see me on Washington Week or they, they see the work that they're supporting um, out in the field that you feel like those are some of the questions that you would be asking at your dinner table. For example, at the height of the pandemic, you know, you were talking about my exchanges with the president, but the information was like, are we going to have enough tests? Are there going to be enough ventilators for everyone who needs one, right? These are critical, critical questions. Questions that my, my family was asking me because in March, 2020, we were all terrified, right? Like yep. we were we, we were so scared. We did not know if we were ever gonna see our family members again. We didn't know how sick we individually could get. And now more than 800,000 Americans have died. And we realize, I think more and more, just how much of a turning point in our history we were covering at the time. What's been your biggest challenge um, as a journalist over the last few years um, and how you report on all of these things and continue to try to give them context? What's been your biggest challenge? It's a great question. I'm not quite sure I have a great answer because there's so many challenges with journalism. Uh, you know, there's there's the real sort of doing the work of journalism. It takes resources. It takes, you know, all sorts of sort of support um, from folks to, to really be able to have the, the resources to go out and, and travel for a story, to tell a story. We're public media, um, which means that, you know, we're really appreciative of so much of all the support that we get from folks because we could not simply do our journalism without the support of the public. Um, I would also say that I think, you know, especially reporting during a pandemic, trying to do stories that connect to people while also being virtual was very, very tough at the beginning. I remember interviewing people at the beginning of the pandemic, um, one woman named Sierra Bates Chamberlain, I'll never forget her name. She had four family members on ventilators at the same time in oh, Chicago. Wow. Just, you know, a heartbreaking story. Her father was sending her text messages. And that's the type of story, if you're a journalist, you want to be there. You want to be holding this person's hand. You want to be talking to them. And it's and we were doing this over Skype. So it was the, the you know, the boundaries of technology and the, and the barriers of technology was also, I think, a, a challenge in terms of just trying to tell these stories and tell them well and tell them in a way that leaves you feeling something, which is, I think, that, that when the best kind of stories that you can tell are the ones where even if you can't remember what the person said, you remember what that story made you feel like. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that that's the great thing about PBS. It's why before I joined PBS, I was a fan of PBS because you... You can't remember all of the different documentaries that Ken Burns has made, but you remember <laughs> the ones that feel that made you feel something. Right. Right? So I remember watching six hours of his cancer documentary, probably for me, one of his, my favorite documentaries of his. And I just remember crying and thinking about how much cancer had, it, had touched my life and touched my family's life. And I think that that's what you're trying to do in daily journalism. You're trying to recreate these frontline missions, these sort of stories that make you stop in your tracks. I, I also love NPR and you have those stories 
um, they call it like a driveway moment where you can't even get out of the car because you can't, you need to listen to the end of this story. Mm -hmm. um, that to me is, is also, I think, a challenge is just trying to really produce that high quality journalism that will stop people and make them want to listen. I mean, I think I'll say the last challenge was, I think, balancing it all. You know, I think that we are, I, I was texting Wesley Morris of the New York Times. He wrote this story that said, the power of a good cry. And I think that we're a nation that is literally collectively mourning 800,000 people, right? And we have learned how to Zoom. We've learned how to be remote. We've learned how to figure out our lives. But I think that we, if we're, if we're true to ourselves, I think that individually we're kind of carrying a lot of this, 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 this feelings with us. And I think for me, the stories that I do, I, I feel the stories. Um, when I think about, you know, all the stories I did during the pandemic, I, I think about just so many people that, that, that stay on my heart. Um, and I think that that's been a challenge to really try to say, okay, how am I going to do this work while also feeling, while also taking care of myself? Absolutely. Um, what's your experience like working for various uh, media outlets kind of all at the same time? How do you keep track of everything? Um, it's great. So for me, I mean, my, my schedule is a little crazy because I'm constantly having to look at my schedule to figure out, okay, when's my next hit? What's going on with that? Um, but so I think balancing it all is, is time-wise, I really have to know how to manage my time and know where I'm supposed to be when. Um, that's something because when I was with PBS NewsHour, I was a contributor for NBC News. So I was, of course, doing daily reporting, but then I was popping up on MSNBC two or three times um, during the day. And then also, of course, making sure that I get there for this, the big six o'clock hit um, on news hour. But I would say now it's, it's, it's sort of now I'm anchoring the show. So I'm thinking about the show all week and figuring out sort of how we want, want the show to be and working with my team um, to, to really craft people and have people at the table that have the best reporting for that week. Um, while also, of course, now I'm going to be starting at NBC News, and that's going to be sort of balancing a full-time job at another network, sort of thinking through sort of what stories as I, I can do as a correspondent and how I can I can balance that with my anchoring duties. I, I'm lucky that I think I have a great, like NBC and, and PBS have such clear and overlapping missions, which is really to do great journalism, that I don't find it to be hard at all to sort of work for these two entities um, because... I, because they both want to do the same thing, which is really, you know, hold people accountable, hold leaders accountable and tell stories about everyday Americans. And so I guess that takes us to the next question is talk about the next step in your professional evolution and, and what that's going to entail and why you decided to do it in the first place. Yeah. So the first thing I would say is, you know, I'm so focused on making sure that I am the best moderator possible. So for me, it is still working on my skills. It is sort of thinking about the show, thinking about new ways we can bring Washington Week to people, thinking about interesting and innovative things to do on Washington Week, while also keeping it to the core of the 54 year legacy of the show, making sure that when people get there, they recognize Washington Week. It's still a round table with the best journalists in the business. But I think I am also thinking of all these other some other ways we can do that, whether it's town halls in people's in people's communities, whether it's it's sort of producing specials. I'm really excited to see sort of where Washington Week to go, which again I think goes back to the idea of how much support really matters because I have all these ideas. Um and, and we and journalism needs resources. We've seen in local news sort of what happens when cities and towns lose their newspapers. I my other than the West, West Side Gazette where I started, I interned at the Miami Herald for two summers. You know, that's a paper that held local officials accountable. Um, and now, it, it, like a lot of newspapers, it's had its financial struggles. So I think for me, I'm thinking about how my professional evolution will also be helped by sort of what we can do in the medium that we're doing it in. So mm -hmm. I, in some ways, I would say that's a long way to say my professional evolution is making Washington Week the best it can possibly be. And then for NBC News, it's 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 sort of taking another step as 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 a correspondent. Um, NBC News, obviously, it's a it's a it's a big place, and I'm really excited to be a Washington correspondent. It's a little different than the White House correspondent because, yes, you're covering the White House and Capitol Hill, but you're also sort of covering on my with my new role the intersection of race and and, and culture. It's also voting rights. It's also going out into communities and doing more traveling. So I'm really excited to also um, sort of take on this new role and be doing more traveling and, and sort of thinking of, of, of all of the ways that politics, both at the White House, but also locally interact and impact people's lives. Um, with the number of social and news media platforms increasing and evolving, um, 
what kind of advice would you be able to give parents about how to encourage media literacy with their kids? And this is kind of personal to me because I have a 14 year old and she has a phone and we kind of, you know, go back and forth with what we think is appropriate usage and what information we want her to have access to and how she accesses it. So what would you what would you say to, I guess, parents like me? Uh, you know, it's a great question. Um, I will, one, I should, I should say my disclaimer is that I do not have children. Mm -hmm. So if you take my advice and something goes wrong, it's not my fault. No, it's okay. But I like, <laughs> I'd like to get a different perspective. You know what but I mean? I would say, you know, for me, I can only go back to like, what in some ways what my mom taught me, immediate, immediate literacy in my house was um, one, having a really good grasp of history. So when you think about sort oh, of when, yeah. what you come to, to, the, to the news with, understanding sort of where this is. So for my, for my mom, who was a social worker for three decades, a professor, um, she was someone who made me read. I had book reports to do just to, my, just to my mother. I had sort of books that she had me reading. I understood the history of Haiti. I understood sort of the history of the United States apart from what I was learning in classes, but like also watching documentaries and learning about sort of what Malcolm X had to say, what Martin Luther King had to say to the world, what Fatty, who Fatty Lou Hamer was, who, who Medgar ever was, right? listening and, and taking in sort of just the history. Because I think when you go to news, the first thing you're going to need is context. And yes, I can try to put in as much context into stories as possible. But I think for people who are trying to teach the next generation, it's really teach them about sort of where they're coming into the world from. I think that's why the 1619 Project by Nicole Hannah Jones is so incredibly important because she and the, and the great people at the New York Times are really trying to put our founding into context. Um, trying to really understand sort of and try to really help us understand the consequences of slavery and how racism touches every aspect of our society. Um, so I think that that's something that I would say. And I would also say growing up in a multilingual lingual household, um, it was really, really helpful because I got so many different media sort of um, media media mediums in that my mom listened to the Haitian radio, which mm -hmm. can be it can be great for information, but I also learned that there could be information where people are just calling in, saying stuff. It's kind of like C-SPAN almost, like, mm -hmm. like people just calling in and you're just saying stuff right, right. and sometimes it's not the right stuff. So I learned also that there's this incredible power of the Haitian radio in that things can be amazingly fast and that's sort of the still the, the number one way that people um, really get their news in Haiti, but it also is sort of the, my first inkling of like misinformation and what that means to fact check things. I also think it's great to watch American news, the, the networks, obviously PBS, obviously NBC, um, the other networks as well. But I also think international news is critically important. Getting your child to understand the BBC news and the and how the French cover us, I think really, really is important um, because we talk about media bias all the time. And there, of course, is there's the propaganda. I would call them propaganda networks that are sort of just spewing misinformation. There's, of course, conservative networks. There's the sort of liberal progressive, um, you know, talk shows. But I think the thing that that all Americans have in common, especially American journalists, is we all live here. We all are making the decision that this is the best place in the world to build our lives. And that in itself of itself can be a bias. When you watch the, how the French or the the English cover us, you're like, oh, they're like, it's a little different. You watch, if you watch the Trump years and sort of maybe the, if you're watching maybe your favorite, your favorite sort of progressive TV show, you might say that this is crazy. Trump is not anything like us. Who, like, who is this guy? If you go to the right, they're like, oh, we love him. He's, you know, he's so brash. He's so real. And then you watch the the sort of Brit British and they're like, the Americans have lost it. And they like, it's like, it's sort of this like very interesting sort of, um, I, I would say it, it's a sort of study in how different media um, and how different the way that people come to a story, how they can all approach a story differently. So if you're looking at media literacy, I would definitely have like, you know, go read this story in the New York Times, PBS, mm -hmm. and then go watch, go see how BBC covered this and see what the differences are. Yeah. Um, states across the country book banning. Um, I almost feel like this is an impossible question. The question is like, is there one book, like if, if all of these great books had to be banned and you had to pick one, which one would it be? But I just feel like it's, I feel like it's an impossible question. <laughs> it is an impossible question because, you know, it's really interesting and it's, it's, it's important to cover the book banning that's going on in this country and to cover sort of why it's happening, um, what is going on in terms of sort of what we want, what we think we're, we're, um, 
what we think we're, we're, we're protecting kids from, what, why this is happening in this moment right now, sort of the consequences of the 1619 Project and the like. So I can't say that I would pick one book, but I will say that I think as a journalist, um, I am very... I'm I'm very inspired to continue to cover this story. And I think it is a cover, a story that needs to be covered, sort of book banning and information. Um, for example, one of the things that I, I always sort of go back to is there was this poll, one of the networks did a poll that said, you know, how young is too young to teach children about race? And it was, and you know, for, for so many African-American scholars, so many African-American sort of parents, they think they would say, they said they were, they responded to that poll. There is no sort of, age because my child will learn about race period right like if you're if, if you have the privilege to not to, to even ask that question we should be having a conversation about what that question even means in a society where there are going to be a lot of kids that are going to learn about race and learn about sort of the othering of people long before teachers or even their parents might say like okay today is the day i'm going to teach my kid about race mm -hmm. Um, so with that, do you think that mainstream media has made progress toward diversity at the journalism level and at the higher levels when you're talking about CEOs of various corporations and companies that, that run media outlets? It's a great question. I would say, I mean, there obviously is always progress. The, um, the fact that I'm now the second Black woman to sit in the Washington Week chair, um, that means something. It also means something that we're seeing um, organizations put resources toward making sure that that their their organizations are diverse and by diverse i mean not only of course racial diversity which is really important but age diversity diversity of experience one of my best editors i ever had in my career he was a carpenter for like three decades so really looking at someone's life experience and saying well what is it what does it mean if we have a media that's only sort of people who went to college and were straight journalists instead of having people that were electricians or people that were I had another colleague that was a soldier in the in, in the army before he became a journalist? I think it's really so great to think about diversity that way. And also I think diversity of of of, of geography. I'm an inclu I'm an East Coaster through and through, grew up in Miami, went to school in, in DC, lived in New York for a bit, but I have in-laws that live in rural Virginia. And I can tell you, having now been to their homes and having seen my own nephew struggle with broadband and have to like go drive out 30 minutes from his home to get Wi-Fi, I understand on a personal level what how important it is to sort of equalize access to the internet and what that means that it's a utility that we now all need and to, to, to sort of better ourselves. So I think also having diversity of geography, but again, um, that doesn't mean that all that, that that diversity sort of needs, to, so I guess I would say diversity in some ways has seen progress and we've seen progress on diversity. Um, but I also think that there are, there's a long way to go. Um, I, I don't think that I've seen recent numbers about how diverse the media is racially, but last time I checked, it was like 3% black. Um, I don't know what the manager, what, what the levels would be for managers, for people who run um, news organizations. We see on the NBC side, Rashida Jones is the first African-American woman to run a major news network. Um, Dean Baquet was the first black um, editor of the New York Times. I've had the, the pleasure of working for one and Dean Baquet at the New York Times and going to work for Rashida Jones yeah. means something that, that we have um, leaders that are diverse, but I think that we definitely have a long way to go. Yeah. Um, can you talk about Gwen Ifill for a little bit? She was a mentor of yours. How... How did she mentor you and how did she help you and how does she inspire you now in the work that you do? Well, I got lucky because I got to see Gwen sort of in all these different ways. Um, she was, of course, the first African-American woman to, to, to host a national news program, to talk program in Washington Week um, in prime time. She was also so she was someone who I watched and, and, and got inspired by just seeing her show up as her full self on TV. Um, we happened to have the same hairdresser. Um, so <laughs> I actually got to meet her through the hairdresser and had my first conversation with her at the dryer. Um, and was she was always super, super supportive. And I was I was a, like a freshman in college and very nervous to meet her, but was someone who um, instantly really kind of breathed confidence in me. Um, and then as I got older, I was really good friends with one of her friends, this woman named Athalia Knight, 
who is a longtime Washington Post reporter. Um, I got to know her even closer as a mentor, as a mentor when I got into TV and got into making decisions about going to the New York Times. And she was able to give me advice just about sort of how to navigate my career. So I got to see her sort of in all the person. I should also add that she spoke at my graduation randomly. Oh, um, you know, wow. the lucky one who who got to have Gwen Eiffel as a speaker. So I feel like I really did experience her both first as someone who was just on TV, then as someone who was on my graduate, the graduation speaker, and then personally through a relationship that that continued for years. And I'm I'm so lucky to have known her personally. And I'm so lucky to now, of course, helm the chair of Washington Week. I still think of it sometimes as Gwen's show. I know her friends say, you know, it's your show now. But I, I know for me, part of what I'm trying to do at Washington Week um, as I use the resources is is to really make sure that I'm doing things that would make Gwen proud. What do you want your legacy to be? I would say as a black woman reporter, doing what you do and being able to tell the stories that you've been able to tell, what do you what do you want your legacy to be? You know, I really hope my legacy is a legacy um, of someone who who did the best she could at making sure that I was e exposing the inequalities in America and that I was telling stories about vulnerable populations and vulnerable people um, and really connecting the federal policies, the White House politics, the Capitol Hill politics to pe everyday people's lives. I hope that by the time I'm done with my career, hopefully in a long, long time from now, um, that people will say Yamish did, Yamish told stories that were relevant um, that were illuminating, that were accurate, and and that were and that showed that she was empathetic to the human experience. And I would say this, the full spectrum of the human experience. I I want to continuously um, not just be talking, telling stories about one side of the political spectrum or the other, but I really want to help people understand each other in ways that they didn't before. Um, I think if you'd like, we could take a few questions um, from our viewers. Would you want to do that? That's great. Let's see. The first one I see here is from Barbara Mostella. She says, do you have staff that assist you when you're gathering information to report the news? For sure. What help do you have? <laughs> so whenever I talk about Washington Week, I always say me and the team because the team is amazing. Um, the teamwork really does make the dream work in the, at Washington Week. Um, I have producers, um, executive producers, as well as line producers, young people, um, veteran reporters who are all sort of working together to put the show together. And I, I, I hope that the show in some ways really reflects the diversity of minds and thought um, that, that comes to, to Washington Week, um, because we really are trying to put on a show that will make that will that will be universally understood um, and so I have a great, great team and I'm really, really lucky. And, you know, I'm a, I'm a new anchor. I've been doing this for 10 months. So for me, it's been really, really important to get feedback, to get people that help me, to help me get comfortable with being on camera in this new way. It sounds like you're really hands on. Like you, are you doing your own story ideas as well in combination with stories that other people bring forward, like your team? Absolutely. So I'm, I'm thinking of story ideas. My team is thinking of story ideas. Even as a correspondent, I'll say, um, you know, I'm thinking of story ideas, even at NBC News. Every time I start a new job, I have like a list of stories that I want to tell and, and a list of story ideas um, when I'm walking in the door. But I also am ready to work with the producers to, to really help me understand sort of what are the stories that we should be telling. So that's also been the case when I was at NewsHour. Um, there were stories that I was assigned, but there were also stories that either a producer came up with or I came up with that were the stories that were close to my heart. So I know one thing that I always often do, and I tell people this all the time when they hire me, um, you know, I'm Haitian American. So for me, I have a special connection to Haiti. Sometimes it's in the news, like it was um, last year with the Haitian migrant issue at the border with border patrol agents um, using horses and reins against against migrants trying to cross the border, but also the assassination of the president. So sometimes it's in the news and it's like, OK, great. You know, we really want to cover Haiti because it's the top story. But sometimes it's me pitching a story and and saying, hey, I want to write about Haiti and it might take three months before it makes air. But I also um, use those skills. Of, I'm fluent in Haitian Creole. So I use my language skills to also do that as well. Nice. Okay, so next question is from Emery John Collinson. Who do you think we'll see in the next presidential election? 
Uh, that's a great question. I have no idea. <laughs> uh, you know, Ben. You know, pr President Biden says he's running, and he says that if he does run, uh, that Vice President Harris will be his running mate. If he doesn't run, we can expect, of course, that the Vice President will likely run for president. On the Republican side, it's anyone's guess. Right now, if the election was held tomorrow, my sources are that say that that Trump would likely want to run. Um, but there are all sorts of things that can happen between now and 2024. So I think it's it's really anyone's guess who ends up being actually on the ticket. What about what do you think of DeSantis? Could happen. Yeah. <laughs> Could happen. I mean, at this point, you never know. Yeah. From Bernard Poskus, don't you think the Republicans uh, don't you think Republicans will do away with the filibuster rule as soon as it becomes inconvenient to their agenda? It's a it's a great question and. I have no idea. I mean, obviously, you have critics of Republicans who say they did away with the filibuster for the Supreme Court the minute right. that it was getting in their way and they were able to get a number of Supreme Court picks through because of that. Um, but I, you know, Mitch McConnell is, is someone that's often hard to read. Um, he is obviously someone who has shown that he politically will do what he thinks is right and necessary in order to get his goals passed through. Um, but I, I'm not quite sure as a reporter that I can say they would definitely do that or definitely not. Right. Um, this one's from Christina. How do we reduce or eliminate false equivalence in journalism? I think by not doing it. Uh, you know, <laughs> just don't do it. Yeah. I mean, that's what it is. I mean, you just can't have false equivalence. So if you're covering climate change, I'm not going to sit here and t talk to the one scientist who thinks the climate's not changing and put him up in a story with another scientist, while one scientist might be might be representing 10 people, another scientist representing 95% of scientists, it just doesn't make sense. I would say the same thing with racism. Um, you know, I, I come from a journalistic point of view that racism is wrong, that people should be treated decently. Um, that is, that is, that sort of is what I come to the, to the, to the job with. And I think that I don't need to be interviewing people that think, no, actually racism is a great thing. I sometimes interview white supremacists um, because they are still a part of our society because you know, there are all so many different things that white supremacists are still doing in our society, but it's not as if I'm going to put them in every story to try to balance um, people who are calling for racial equality. But do you think it's important on some level to cover them because they still exist and they're still there and they're still using the voices that they have? That's interesting. Yeah. I would say certainly. I mean, think about, I mean, we're living through a time right now where um, we are living with the largest insurrect, the, the aftermath of the largest attack on the U.S. Capitol. Covering white supremacy has to be part of that because we have to understand sort of who are these people, how much do they make up this crowd of people who broke in? Were they the masterminds or did they happen to be there? Um, what does it mean that there that there are these white supremacist groups? I also think about the idea of of sort of um, COVID and 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 vaccines, the anti-vaxxer movement. We've seen it sort of in some ways overlap with white supremacy and white supremacist movements. I think that's also a, a really important thing to really report out and help people understand. Um, so it definitely is, is, is an important thing to cover. I think that we just have to be really, really smart and careful with how we do it. I'm thinking about, um, I don't know if anybody's listened to the podcast, Becoming Oprah, but <laughs> I'm, I love Oprah. So I listen to a lot of stuff about her life. And she talked about um, one time where she brought on these white supremacists on the Oprah Winfrey show. And she was like mid show. I think I remember she, that. Yeah. Yeah. And she paused and she paused mid show because she realized her platform was being used. She mm -hmm. felt like she was no longer sort of in control that these white supremacists were sort of like they were, they were sort of doing, they were sort of taking over the show and it wasn't, and she couldn't really understand what the intention was behind having them on the show. That to me is something that sticks with me. Um, you know, we really have to understand sort of what is the intention with which we use people that are, that are objectively bad actors in our society. If you're a white supremacist, I would consider you to be a bad actor in our society. So you really have to be very cautious and very smart about how you 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 use them. Apologies, that last question was actually from David Reed, not Christina. I misread that. Um, this next one looks like it's from Thaddeus Knapp. How has your experience as a reporter changed? How has it changed you as a person? It's a great question. I mean, I've been doing journalism now for more than half my life. So I'm, I don't, it's, it's, it's hard to say how journalism has changed me because has it always just been in you. Like, yeah, for me, I think it has always been in me. It's always been in me to want to ask questions. I've always loved being before I, before journalism was my calling. 
Um, I always loved writing. So for me, it's sort of just, it, so, so, for, so for me, I can't say that journalism has changed me as much as it's kind of the thing that has allowed me to grow up. I've grown up while being a journalist. So that's made me very empathetic to people. Um, I don't know if that me. I don't think it's changing me as much as it's helping me evolve and grow. I, I as, as someone, because I'm someone who's, who's interviewed Trump supporters, I've interviewed Biden supporters, I've interviewed Bernie Sanders supporters. I have this empathy that, which, which is that I think most Americans are really just trying to find the best way to survive and live and thrive in their lives. Everybody wants to make good money. Everyone wants to be able to have a nice house. Everyone wants their kids to be healthy, for themselves to be healthy, for them to have a uh, good education. That's that's often what is the connective tissue between all Americans. The question is, how do you get there? And that's where you have, of course, splits and different person and different ideas. But I think understanding that there is this empathy that needs to happen and that there needs to be a sort of real, um, a, a real interest in learning about other people. If you want to be a journalist, then I think that that is the thing that has absolutely helped me and, and helped me grow. Okay, from Dan Diamond. What are the issues you're most optimistic about and what issues concern you the most in Washington today? I probably, I'm, I'm trying to think of the best way to answer that question. It's a, it's a great question, but I mean, I think that, I mean, the thing that, that keeps me up and the thing that I will say that, that I'm concerned about, I don't know if there's, if I'm optimistic about one and not optimistic about the other, but I think sort of the, the American democracy as a whole, I'm really interested in seeing what happens with with January 6th, what happens with this investigation, how we as a society sort of uh, get to the place where we can have another election. Um, being that I'm a, I'm a child of Haitian immigrants and I've done a lot of reporting on Haiti, I know how fragile democracy is. And I think that, you know, I'm really, really concerned and interested about sort of how American democracy evolved. I'm also really, really interested and continually be, continuously I'm interested in sort of race relations um, and sort of how we're still struggling with with sort of the basic how we all live and die. I remember when I first started um, in journalism thinking about Emmett Till, I thought that the sort of racial issues that I would be covering would be wage disparity or might be microaggressions at work or it might be sort of affirmative action. I thought that it would be sort of the next phase of sort of race relations, which is sort of, you know, how we all thrive when in fact we're still on like, how do we all survive? Black people are still three and three times more likely about than white people to be killed by the police. We're still constantly seeing videos of, of people um, who are being murdered and in, in, in ways that sometimes are unjustified. When we think about the murder of George Floyd or the murder of Ahmaud Aubrey. Um, so I think that for me, it's, it's something that I, I definitely am, am still very much interested in and very concerned about just the idea that in 2022, we're still really talking about how black people are killed unjustly. And that is the conversation that they were having in the 1960s and in 1955 when Emmett Till was killed. Mm -hmm. Let's see, another one from Thaddeus Knapp. Most of us Americans don't get to see the depth of your of our fellow citizens, but as a reporter, you're often provided unique access to the range of lives and ways of living that make up our country. Is there anything you wish more Americans could tag along and see or experience when you report stories? Ooh, that's a good one. Yeah, I think I really wish people could just go into people's living rooms and try to really, especially people that maybe even disagree with. Um, and I don't mean disagree about there are some things, I think there are political disagreements um, and then there are sort of life and death disagreements, right? So I don't mean that you should go into the living room of a KKK member. But right, I do you don't, we're not disagreeing about room. racism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, but I think if it's like, if you're a Republican, it would, I think that, that, that it would be great if our country could sit down and just sort of have people on both sides of the aisle um, just see sort of what, the, why people think the way they think. Because I really do think there is this double jeopardy um, that was called Black Jeopardy. I think it was called Black Jeopardy or Double Jeopardy um, SNL skit <laughs> with, a, with a Trump supporter. And it was a supporter of, I think at the time, of Hillary Clinton. I think it was 2016. And they were sort of answering the questions the same. They wanted a good wage. They wanted good jobs. They wanted you know their kids to be go to good schools. But it was how they got there that was the big difference. 
And I think for me as a reporter, especially as we think about civil discourse and sort of the way forward with American democracy, I really wish that people could just sort of understand each other a bit better. Um, it's so easy to make a, make, make a boogeyman out of someone that you do not understand. And as a journalist, I've had the, the real privilege of meeting people who have completely different political um, ideas and, and, and outlooks, but who are really striving for the same thing. From Ruth Warren, what, what do you think will happen in the midterms? Is it really going to be a sweep for the Republicans? These are great questions that I wish I had a, a crystal ball to answer. Right, exactly. No, I have no idea what's going to happen in the midterms. Um, you know, I think redistricting is going to be really interesting. At one point, they thought redistricting was going to be a terrible thing for Democrats. It doesn't It doesn't seem to be as much, um, according to experts. But we also, of course, have a case out in Alabama that the Supreme Court just decided, which was um, there are some civil rights activists who say that the that the lines being drawn in Alabama dilute on purpose um, the political voting power of minorities and black people. A lower court said that they needed to redraw the lines. The Supreme Court is saying that they don't. Um, you know, in North Carolina, we saw another another federal judge, or I should say, another judge say, because um, it's a state judge actually. In North Carolina, we saw a judge say that the that the the, the way that the lines are being drawn were unconstitutional. That's the second time that that's happened in North Carolina in, in, that I've been thinking of in, in the last few years, um, given that a judge said that there are Black people being targeted with surgical precision to try to cut them out of their voting power. So there's a lot of, of, of stuff going on. Um, and it's sort of anyone's guess where it all lands. Because I think the other thing that is really fascinating covering politics, politicians sort of want to set the agenda. But I think real life issues actually sent the agenda. You think about 9-11 and what they did to George W. Bush. You think about Afghanistan or other things. Like there are other events that just happen and then you have to deal with them. Think about the, the pandemic, right? Would There are some people who would wonder, would former President Trump have lost had, he, had there not been a pandemic where he basically downplayed it, um, where he said it was going to disappear, he where he also- hopes. Yeah. Right. And, and where his administration were integral to, to, to creating vaccines, right? All of those things are true. Trump, under his leadership, there were vaccines developed. Under his leadership, people, he was also telling people to take bleach, right? So it's like, it's, it's this weird sort of thing that happened. And I think that we might see something like that happen where, you know, the insurrection happens and that changes the way that people see politics. So who knows what will happen before 2022 at the end of this year? Let's see, from Bruce Petrie, what are you finding to date concerning the percentage of misinformation you have been given by spokespersons for Trump versus Biden when questions are answered by these folks? So I think that kind of goes back to one of my original questions, like, do you find you trust this administration more? Um, yeah, I mean, I think it goes to my original answer, which is I don't trust anyone with information. Um, and especially not if information where you're an elected official, where you have an agenda. Uh, and, and and that's the way the Constitution is, right? Like presidents are going to have their agendas. Um, they're going to want to look at numbers and say, OK, here are the numbers that that are good for my for my constituencies, for what I'm trying to do out here. And maybe these numbers don't work for me. So for me, I'm constantly always questioning the information that I get always double checking the information, um, whether it's the Trump administration or the Biden administration. Part of how I actually do my job has not changed that much. Um, I, one, one of the last questions I quest, I asked um, former president, or I should say, one of the questions I asked former President Trump that he got super mad at me about was on testing. Last year, at the right at the end of the year, um, or maybe it was right at the beginning of this year, one of the questions that I asked, for, that I asked President Biden was on testing. Um, it continues to be an issue that has been a problem for Americans. We have not had the access to testing that, we, that other countries have had. We're starting to now see, obviously, the Biden administration now mailing out free tests to Americans who who request them. But I think the actual doing of the job, while it might look different, mm -hmm. uh, my actual mission is still the same, and that's to get truth. That's to 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 really make sure that my reporting is accurate. From Enrique Jimenez. How have new social platforms affected accuracy in reporting when any opinion can, can become highly visible and gain traction in just in such a short amount of time? So anyone can say anything and lots of people will believe it. How do you how do you work around that? 
I don't try to work around that. Um, you know, we live in reality. There are going to be people that are going to say things. Nicki Minaj can put out a, a tweet about sort of vaccines and what she thinks about them. And that can just be in the ether along with Dr. Fauci's actual accurate information. So, you know, I don't try in some ways when I'm doing my reporting in the back of my mind, I'm not thinking, OK, well, there's a lot of false information and I'm really trying to clear it up. I'm thinking, what's the best way for me to accurately describe what my story is? And how do I get it to the to the sort of most visible place so that enough people see it? So that to me, I mean, Washington Week is a great show because of that. We have these great reporters that come on who share the same values that I share, which is just truth telling and being accurate. And they're on top of the, the biggest stories of our time. And then that allows us to sort of really be able to tell stories and to be able to sort of share information with the public. So I'm not worried about, you know, there's a lot of misinformation out there. My job is to just try to tell the truth and to really um, focus on, on, on the ways that I can give people accurate information. From Patty Pacey in Boulder, do you think those individuals who want to ban books from schools also want to ban Joe Rogan from Spotify? Do you know if there is any research on these inconsistencies? Is it, I have no idea. Um, mm -hmm. I, don't, I haven't seen any research. Um, I know people who are critical of those who are trying to ban books they would say that there's an agenda there, that it's not really about sort of banning misinformation. It's about sort of making information um, fit their worldview. So I know that obviously we're in this inflection point where we're seeing a Joe Rogan who has admitted to using racial epithets um, and also has misinformation on his show. We're seeing that happen at the same time as people are seeing people push back um, on accurate information. You know, the 1619 Project is a good example. I mean, we all know the 1619, or maybe we know now, 1619 is the year that the first enslaved, kidnapped Africans were brought to our shores. We know that we were a country founded on land that was that was stolen from Native Americans. I don't think that it's in dispute at all, and it shouldn't be in dispute that that's what our founders did at the founders of this nation, and that African Americans were forced to work without pay, that there were families ripped apart and all sorts of violence done to their bodies. Um, and I think that there are consequences to that. And I think we're living in this, this, this time period where there are some people who absolutely do not want to face those consequences, who don't want to acknowledge those consequences. And that's why we're, I think we're really dealing with this period um, where people are trying to ban books or they're trying to you know, say that this, this, this podcast that is, is that's spreading misinformation, is, but is really entertaining is what they want instead of, instead of something else. Um, but I think as a journalist, you know, I'm lucky that my job is a little bit is a little removed from that in that my job, the job of Washington Week, is to bring you information that you can trust. Um, what I love about PBS is that every year we are the most trusted news source. It means something, I think, especially in this age of disinformation, that people, when they come to PBS, they still trust it. They really think of it as, as news that is going to be um, presented to them by people who don't have a sort of nefarious agenda, that we are here to give you um, news that it, that is important and that is worth your time. So for me, that that is also, I think, key to why having resources and having support is so important is because, you know, we couldn't do that work without folks like you who are watching it and others um, supporting our work. From KT Johnson, what are your views of what's happening in Ukraine? You know, I think it's, it's to me, it is absolutely still a very fluid situation. Um, you have President Biden, who is trying to make sure that he is being cautious and not wanting to provoke Russia. But you also have in Russia and Vladimir Putin, someone who is really making his calculations um, based on what's best for him and um, really is someone who, based on my reporting, isn't someone that you can sort of guess what he's going to do. I've talked to a lot of White House officials who say it's anyone's yes what Vladimir Putin does in the end. Um, he obviously has enough soldiers on the Ukrainian border to invade the entire country. But then we hear reporting from great people like Vivian Salama, who was on Washington Week two weeks in a row um, from Ukraine, which is which is incredible, um, telling us, talking to us about how sort of Ukrainian people were not sort of in a a we're, we're not looking at this as a sort of imminent crisis. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that, that was really important in reporting because there was a sense that things are brewing and brewing and brewing. And now we've seen the White House say, actually, we're going to pull back from using the word imminent. We don't think that that's a, a good way to describe the situation. So I think that 
it's 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 an it's a, it's a situation that we're gonna have to keep on watching, keep on covering. And I'm lucky that at Washington Week we can do domestic and foreign because we have this sort of family of reporters um, who have all these different expertise and who can come and and and, and talk to us. From Connor, what's the effect of record low trust in government institutions and democracy on journalism? That's a good one, too. It's a great question because, you know, we really have to like when we t- when we talk about sort of the the trust in media being down, I think I saw, I saw someone on Twitter make a really good point that the trust in government is down. The trust in science is down. We are sort of living through this period where Americans are skeptical. They're questioning everything. They're not trusting everything. We're also living through this period where people are frankly traumatized by living through a pandemic um, and having to deal with sort of being so far apart from each other and not having the human connection that we would have if I was able to go to, to Colorado tonight. Um, so I think that in some ways, it's impacting journalism by making us have to just work harder. We have to make sure that we're doing good reporting, that we understand that people are coming to us having had sort of this experience that might be touching misinformation or or taking in misinformation, that we are really doing the job um, of, of giving people information that they can trust. I will also say, though, that in some ways that doesn't change the job. When I became a journalist the goal of journalism, the goal of journalism in 1955 when Emmett Kill, when Emmett Till was killed was to show people the truth of America. It was to tell the story of what happens to a 14 year old boy who gets murdered um, by a group of racist white men, right? So in some ways the, the mission of journalism hasn't changed just because sort of everyone's sort of recalibrating how much they trust the media or trust science or trust government. Um, the mission still has to be the mission. From Andrew, the very foundation of our democracy is under increasing attack in the United States. What greater, what greater role can the media play in combating this threat? I think we just have to keep covering it. You know, we cannot get tired of covering sort of what's happening to American democracy. And we also have to meet people where they are. Um, so one of the things that is important at PBS is that we are constantly thinking of new ways to tell stories. So with Washington Week, we have Washington Week on YouTube, on Facebook. We have it on Twitter. We have clips going out. We have a TikTok page. We have Instagram. We're trying to meet people where you are. I think the, the role of journalism has to be not only ha- making it easy for people to find you, making sure that we're telling people it's 8 o'clock at your local station, um, I know you guys are, are a different time zone, but you know, telling people what time to watch things, but also it means that if you're on Facebook, then you should be able to see a clip of me and we should be making sure that we're waving at you saying, hey, hey, look at this information. It's really, really important. So I think that that is in some ways what the role of journalism has to be and the responsibility of living through these times. Um, I think, so we have about five minutes, a couple minutes left. I think we can do maybe one or two more. Um, next one is what, what's an issue or story you feel isn't getting enough attention? It's, you know, I will have to, I have to think about that because I think that there's, there's a lot of stuff that we're covering. Um, I mean, Haiti is always going to be a story that I think we need to be covering. Um, you know, the assassination of the Haitian president in July made the world sort of turn and say, what, what in the world is going on in Haiti? Um, but because it's a story that I've been covering for so long, it, it is really a story that needs to be um, really needs to be to, to be looked at, um, especially as we think about American democracy. Haiti is a prime example of the fragility of democracy and what happens when you have um, gangs taking over a country where you have a, a real drop in credibility and of trust in government. So I think it's not just that Haiti is it is a story that matters morally. I think it also for American for an American audience, it should be in some ways a cautionary tale for what happens um, when things get out of hand. So I think that's the story that we definitely need to be covering more of. Um, you know, I think you know, I I think that there's always room to to do more stories about sort of the privilege issues with the pandemic. When I think about the, when I when I when I say that, I mean we talk about social distancing, we talk about working from home. Um, these are words that some people cannot use. You know, if you're an Amazon worker, like a woman I met named Ruby Quintanilla, um, she cannot work from home. And by the way, she's also going to be um, the group of people who are more likely to take the public transportation because people of color are more likely to be having to take public transportation. So she's an Amazon worker who not only cannot work from home, but she has to take a public transportation to work. And then she has to come home and take care of elderly parents. 
So mm -hmm. she cannot social distance from her parents because she has to actually physically take care of them. Another story I did was about immigrants. Um, these immigrants in from Honduras living seven people to a two bedroom apartment in Virginia. When we talk about social distancing um, and quarantining, um, in that house, someone got sick with COVID and one person was in a room by themselves and then there were six people to the other room. Um, it's really, really hard to help to, to, to tell, cover those stories. But I think that's the thing that I hope we don't lose sight of. We're now in year three, the third year of the pandemic. And I hope that we don't just get used to saying things like, okay, well now you have to quarantine. Well, now you can get to stay from home. When some people, a lot of Americans cannot do that. Um, a lot of Americans cannot do the things that have become sort of the language of the pandemic. Okay. Let me see. Do we have room for one more question? Yes. Okay. From Meredith, what interviewing techniques are you using to get interviewees to answer questions and not just use it as a platform spin? Does it work? There are a lot of techniques. Um, interviewing techniques, uh, you know, it's put people at ease. It's being respectful of people. So, you know, if I'm coming into someone's house, I've, I've done this a lot of times, unfortunately, um, when I'm coming into someone's house who has just lost a loved one, maybe they are, their loved one, like Michael Brown, um, as I've interviewed his mother, your son's shot by the police, and I'm now on your doorstep wanting to talk to you. I want to make sure that you know that I'm compassionate, that I care about what's happening to you, that I'm not um, assuming that you have, have to talk to me. I want to earn your trust. If it's a politician, it's someone who's trying to spin, it's making sure that I'm armed with facts. So I think about the Trump years, before I would go into a, a press conference or before I would go into a briefing, I would try to have as much information as I can at my fingertips so that I at times um, could fact check the president or whoever in real time. So I remember um, one exchange with the president was when I asked him about the, the pandemic's office that had been housed in the National Security Council. And the president, I said, you know, what, what happened to that office? It was disbanded and that was never, um, there were no people that, that, that went to go work for that office. And now we're in the middle of a pandemic. Like what in the world, how is that going to impact your response to this pandemic? And he was like, what office, huh? What are you talking about? And I'm like, okay, well, here's the office. Here are the people who work there. Um, this happened under your watch, right? So I think sort of giving the information back, as you said, at the top, at the, at the top of this, always having the information to give back to people. I also say on Washington week, and I'll let you in on a secret here. I write questions and then I write basically the answers as I, as best I know them to those questions. In some ways I never want to be, I want to be asking questions and also being armed with the information. So it might not be my reporting. It might be that I read, you know, 12 articles on the New York times and I have new information that isn't my reporting. But the point is that, cause you know, we, there's, there's sort of a limit in how much time you have in a day, but I want to make sure if I'm covering a subject that I don't feel comfortable with, and I'm not an expert on foreign policy, I'm not an expert on Russia or Ukraine. So I want to make sure that I'm armed with information um, so that if we're having a conversation about that, that I have that information at my fingertips. So when I'm asking questions on Washington week, I'm making sure that my transitions and that I'm listening and that I'm really making sure that the, the conversation is lively, but I'm also making sure that it's informative so that if someone says something that I know not to be true, I can quickly correct them. Um, it doesn't really happen that often because our journalists on Washington week are armed with their facts. But if I need to, I can do that because I have um, a lot of information on the questions that I'm asking. Great. Well, um, I just got the signal that we have used up all of our time. Um, I bet there would be so many more great questions coming in. And I want to thank you, Yamish Alcindor, for spending this time with us. Um, I want to thank everybody at PBS, at Rocky Mountain PBS. This was um, so informative and wonderful, and we really appreciate your time. So thank you. Thank you very much for doing this. Thanks and so everybody, much. have a great evening.